So how's everybody doing? Morning. Doing good? All right. So for the past three Sundays, my dear brothers and sisters, um, we have discussed about how um, to be truly happy. And so far, um, what we have discussed are the followings, you know, with everything in between them. So we discussed your joy must be in the Lord. You must change your perspective. We discussed about being a visionary. You know, as we live here on earth, we must live for heaven. And we also discussed about how you should be happy by enjoying all your blessings in life. And that blessings of yours should lead you towards godliness. And number four is for us to be happy, we must practice happiness. And we discussed that perfect practice makes perfect. Now, now that we know how to be truly happy, now as part of our happy series, because we are just continuing our happy series, we are in our, I don't know what part it is, <laughs> but the next question is, how to sustain your joy? All right, how to sustain your joy in the Lord? Okay. Do you know that the, that the book of Philippians, okay, the scripture reading a while ago, that the book of Philippians is one of the most joyful book in the Bible because it talks about joy. And if you will Google it, the joy is mentioned 15 or 16 times, depending on the version that Bible version that you will use. Okay, in those four chaptered books, 16 times. And it is often referred to as the epistle of joy. Okay? And uh, Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote the book of Philippians. A prison, a place where we would typically associate misery you know, and loneliness. But it was the opposite for Apostle Paul. He wrote this to express his appreciation, to express his affection to the Philippian brethren, and to express his true joy. Imagine Paul in prison, instead of being miserable, instead of being lonely, he was expressing his joy to all the believers that despite his circumstances, he still exudes joy and thankfulness. Now remember, Paul was in prison when he wrote the book of Philippians. Now he was telling all of us that we can find, that you can find real joy and that we can be truly happy even in the darkest moment of your life. Since and because we have and you have Jesus Christ. That's why Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Now you see, Apostle Paul said, I can do all things, even to be happy. All right? Even to be happy while locked up in prison. Okay? Now his, his circumstances did not dictate his happiness. Why? Because he had Jesus Christ. He had Jesus Christ in his life. And according to Paul, the reason why he can do all things, look at that, because Jesus gives him strength. Apostle Paul's joy is in the Lord and that Jesus Christ is the one who gives him strength. That's why he can do all things. Even if they lock him up in prison, he can be smiling and he can be joyful. All right? And then look at what Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. When Apostle Paul was converted to Christ, it was his joy. His joy of what? His joy to bring honor to Christ. Always. That's why one of the main themes of the book of Philippians is the command of Paul to everyone. The famous Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If you will read the book of Philippians, you will find the word joy 
over and over again because the Lord wants you and I to be joyful despite of the circumstances we are in. Now again, the question, how are we going to sustain your joy? Okay, how? The answer is, we must grow in Christ's likeness. We must live the Christ-centered life. In order for you and I to sustain those joy, I must grow in Christ's likeness and I must live a Christ-centered life. Okay. Now, let us all ask this question to ourselves. I want you to ask this question. Am I truly a Christian? Am I truly a Christian? That is an answer or a question that we need to answer with all honesty in our life. Now, answer that truthfully in yourself. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. And Christ-likeness means you imitate Christ and you live a Christ-centered life. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Apostle Paul said, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Follow my example, just as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible said, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. And in other translation, it says there, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. Now, but you know, people have so much excuse in life. You know what I mean? People have so much excuse in life. They would say, well, but Brother Mike, is it even possible to live as Jesus lived? He is God. I'm only human. You know, we make a lot of excuse. Just like baptism, the issue about baptism, those who oppose it will say, you know, what if Brother Mike, and I have heard this many times in my life, what if Brother Mike, if I am in a desert, there's no water, then I wanted to accept the Lord. What if Brother Mike, if I'm in an airplane up there, and then all of a sudden I want to accept the Lord. And the plane crash. You know, the people will come up with absurd excuses, right? You know, they will come up with any excuses. People will try to rebut even the teachings of Jesus Christ just to satisfy their disobedience to God. Now, remember, excuses are for those who just don't want to follow, right? Do you agree with that? Right. We have so many excuses if you don't want to follow Christ. We put a lot of excuses. Now, first things first. Before you grow in Christ's likeness, you must first die with Christ. In order for you to sustain that joy, you must learn to die with Christ. Now, without understanding this, you will never understand the meaning of your Christian life. Because dying yourself with Christ is the essence of your Christian life. And that is the beginning of a Christ-centered life. Okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 36, Apostle Paul said this principle. The seed that you plant will not live unless it dies. Okay? Now, spiritually speaking, you and I must die a spiritual death before we can live a Christ-centered life. Now, do you remember when you were baptized? Do you remember that day when you were baptized into Christ? Remember, you were baptized into His death. And remember that you were buried with Him. As it says in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into His death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And do you know, when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ at that time, 
you consciously agree that you are willing to give up your life for Christ. Do you remember that? Do you remember you made a bow to Christ? Do you remember that? Do you remember? That you are willing to die a death like His when you accepted Him, when you were baptized into His name. I know you remember those times and those words that you utter when you accepted the Lord, right? Now, do you know that in verse 5 it says, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Now, it says there, united. It says that you unite yourself with God. Unite, you unite yourself with Jesus Christ when you accepted Him at that time and when you were baptized into His name. Again, do you still remember the vow that you made to God at that time? Now, I keep on repeating that because I want each and every one of us to go through that day again. Relive that day when you pledge your vow to God, when you pledge your allegiance to God, that you will give your life to Jesus Christ at all costs. Right? We all made that vow to Christ. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean that like his. Now, does it mean that we need to be crucified? No, of course not. Okay. Now, we can see the answer in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Christ himself was like God in everything, but he did not think that being equal with God, but he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on the cross. Now, what is the meaning, my brothers and sisters and friends, those who are watching us in Zoom, what is the meaning of death like his? Number one, Christ denied himself of his glory in heaven, his Godship. He left that. Okay, number two. It says there in Philippians chapter 2 that we just read, Christ bowed down. He was humble. He humbled himself. He bowed down to his father because he was human. He recognized his father's sovereignty. And number three, in that verse that we read a while ago, Christ obeyed his father. He was obedient. Obedient up to death. On the cross. And number four, death like his is because Christ loved his father. John 14 31, but so that the world may know without any doubt that I love the father, I do exactly as the father has commanded me and act in full agreement with him. Okay. Now, this time, when Jesus uttered this word, he was about to die. He was about to die. And he uttered the words, as you can see, I love the Father. Nothing mattered to Jesus more than his love for his Father. Remember that. Nothing mattered to Jesus more than his love for his Father. Number one. And those words were not just expressions. When he uttered the word, I love the Father, it is not just merely an expression. He lived it. He lived those words every single day. Now, Jesus, he endured the pain and horrors of the cross because of love. His entire ministry was motivated by love. Okay. It was a joy for him because of love. Number one, love for his father. Number two, love for you and I. And number three, love for himself. His self was last in the hierarchy. If you can see the hierarchy of love. Okay? His love for himself was last. Okay? He was so willing to give up 
himself for you and I. And in return, Jesus wants you to have that same debt like his. Now how? How are you going to have the same debt like his? Now number one, and we will go back to this later on. Number one, again, Jesus, remember our slides ago, Jesus denied himself. So we too must deny ourselves. In Matthew 16, 24, the Bible said, Apostle Matthew said, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. You must deny yourself and take up their cross and follow me. Now the word deny in Greek, it means to utterly separate, to severe, to cut, okay? to completely disown from something. That is the meaning of the word deny. Now the idea of denying, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, the idea of denying is to severe, to separate ourselves, including your goals, your motives, your relationship, so far as they come into conflict with our relationship with Christ and our claim for heaven, which only a true servant deserves. If those things, your goal, your ambition, gets in conflict with your relationship with Christ, then the Bible said you must severe, you must cut that ambition of yours in order for you to pursue that true relationship with Jesus Christ. And that is the meaning of the word deny. Okay. Even what makes you happy. Materially, you have to cut the tie in order for you to live a true relationship for Christ. And number two, Jesus bowed down to God. Okay. A while ago, we presented that he was, he humbled himself before God. Jesus then, he said, take up your cross. Okay. To take up your cross in simple words means you are willing, you are willing to pay the price for Jesus. But the question is, are you willing to pay the price for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to accept with joy whatever circumstances comes to your life because of Jesus Christ. And finally, are you truly willing to give up anything? Are you willing to give up anything for Christ? Are you willing to bow down just as Jesus bowed down to the Father and gave himself up for you and I? Are you willing to take up that cross? The number three, Jesus was obedient to God up to the cross. Now, look at the verse again. <clears throat> Jesus said, follow me. Okay. He was obedient up to the cross. It means full obedience to him. If he was obedient to God the Father, then we too must be obedient to Christ. Okay. Our loyalty must only and only be with Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, you know, our loyalty is to the people rather than to Jesus Christ because of something that we get from them. Right? We give our loyalty to them because we have something in return. The saying that goes, never bite the hand that feeds you. Right? So that's why we are loyal to people. We are never loyal to Christ. But we have to remember, all the material things comes from Christ. All that you have comes from Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus demands obedience at all costs, even if it costs your life. And that is full obedience. Number four, Jesus loved the Father. Okay? In the same way that Jesus loved the Father, so we must love Jesus Christ. All motives of our actions must be love for Jesus. Just like what Jesus did. His motive for his ministry is for love, about love for his Father. Then therefore, our motive must also be love for Jesus Christ. Remember, 
Joy is about loving our Father. Or loving Jesus' joy is about loving His Father, first and foremost. And then loving us, and then loving Himself. And so, we must follow the hierarchy. We must follow the hierarchy, the same pattern. Look at this. Jesus, okay, it was a joy for Him because of love. Love for His Father. Okay? Love for His Father. Then love for us. And then love for Himself. Now, we must also have that same pattern of love. When you truly put your joy in the Lord, you are following the same pattern. You are following the same pattern. Now, do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, what joy stands for? J-O-Y. When you have that joy really in your life, you are following the same pattern that Jesus did. Loving the Father, loving us, and loving Himself. Joy stands for Jesus. Okay. Joy stands for Jesus. Jesus, when He was here on earth, His love, first and foremost, the Father. Now, in return, as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, our love, our priority is Jesus Christ. Same, right? Now, what is the O? Others. When Jesus walked on earth, he think of the others. Number one, God the Father, then others. We too. When you truly follow Christ, you won't think of yourself. You will think of Jesus, you will think of others, and what is why? Any guess? Any visitor? It's you. When you have truly that joy in the Lord, if you truly die in Christ, you are following the pattern of Jesus Christ when He loved the Father when he loved us and he loved himself last. If you have that joy, if you have that same mind, that same concept, that same attitude, that same principle, you love Jesus first. You love others. And lastly, yourself. Okay? Until you understand that baptism must lead you to this, having this joy, Jesus others you, you miss the beauty and joy of Christianity. Only in this way, you truly die a death like his. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. It is only by true joy brought about by love, that you can lose your life to Jesus Christ. And in so doing, you will find your life. You will find your purpose in life and can live a peaceful and happy life here on earth. And this will lead you to an everlasting joy and happiness in heaven. Apostle Paul found the true meaning of joy in the Lord when he died with Christ. When Apostle Paul died with Christ, and when Christ raised him anew, it was not Paul anymore that lived, but Christ lived in Apostle Paul. And the new life that Apostle Paul lived, he lived for Christ. He died with Christ, and he lived for Christ. That's why he said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been, I have crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Those are exactly the words of Apostle Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lived in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live 
my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, my beloved brothers and sisters and friends, until you put your sinful nature to death, until you understand the concept when you accepted the Lord and was baptized into Christ, you will never understand the beauty and joy of Christianity. Until you put your sinful nature to death, for if you continue to live according to the flesh, you will definitely die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. To sustain your joy in the Lord, you must live a Christ-centered life. And by dying in Christ is the only beginning, is only the beginning how you will sustain that joy in the Lord. For the past weeks again, we have been discussing how to be truly happy. In the following weeks, Lord willing, as, I have, as we have discussed, that we must live a Christ-centered life. How are you going to live a Christ-centered life in order for you to sustain that joy that you have right now? Now, let me encourage you, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, look into your life. Look into your life if you really died with Christ. Now, my friend, and those who are in Zoom right now, if you have not accepted the Lord, you are not missing a third of your life. You are not even missing three-fourths of your life. You are missing your whole life. Without the Lord, you are missing everything in life. Amen. You are missing everything in life. Now, as we sing the song of invitation, Brothers, sisters, and friends, I ask you, now please come forward. Maybe this is a good day to die with Christ. <laughs> it's a good day to die with Christ. You know why? The Bible said today is the day of salvation. Okay? Now shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation?